Luke chapter number 8, if you will. And uh, we're going to read the latter part of the chapter and uh, begin our reading in verse number 43. Luke chapter 8 and the 43rd verse. Very familiar story. A lot transpires in this chapter of the book of Luke. A lot of events happen in the Lord's life. A lot of memorable things transpire that uh, you would be familiar with if we were to look at them. Maniac of Gadara, Jairus' daughter at home, sick, and, uh, you know, uh, this son uh, that was, uh, you know, needing help from the Lord. But in the middle of this, we find an event here that I want us to highlight for just a few moments. Verse 43, a woman and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him, touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched. Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee, and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? Jesus said, Someone hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, falling down. So it's obvious she had gotten up and was walking away. She's falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people, for what cause she had touched him, and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her daughter, Be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And with that, we'll end our reading there this morning. And um, we look at the Lord as he comes into this city of Capernaum. And there is a great throng of people waiting for the Lord. And uh, I'm sure there are some there out of gratitude because it was in Capernaum. There were several things that had happened that, that are notable. Uh, you find that uh, the demonic was healed. We've mentioned that. And I would imagine he would be there to receive the Lord. It was in Capernaum where Simon Peter's mother-in-law was sick and she was healed. I would imagine that they were there with friends and maybe neighbors who received the Lord. It was in the town of Capernaum where there was a man that had four friends and he was a paralytic and his four friends were concerned about his health and they did a lot of work to get that man to the Lord. And uh, I would imagine that they would probably be there. But in our text, we are not reading about them. We're reading about a nameless lady who was in the greatest need. And um, she comes to the Lord. Our thought here this morning is uh, in verse number 45, where Peter and they that were with them said, Master, says, Master, the people throng thee and press thee. And thou sayest, Who touched me? And the Lord says, I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Uh, you know, through the Gospels, the Lord is reverenced or referred to rather as many things, but my thought is about the Master. There are so many Master references to the Lord. I preach about eight or ten sermons in a series about the Master and the Master of Peace, Master of Care, Shall Not We Perish, Master of Pursuit, the Master is coming, calling for thee, and on and on we go. But here we find a master of perception. I perceive, I know, I, 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 I don't want to use the word realize, but uh, 
uh, that would be a term we would call if we were talking about ourselves. Uh, I, I know something has happened. I perceive. And you know, this morning the Lord is the master of perception. You know, tonight they'll play a ball game and uh, they'll hold up their finger, the winning team, and they'll say, we're number one. Uh, and uh, the way the record shows, they would rightfully say they won the title of the top team in this particular game, but they're not a master of that game because uh, no, next year they'll probably not even be close to getting there. And Then there's musicians, they play, and they, there's some great musicians, they do a great job on their instruments, but really there's always room for improvement, they've not mastered it. Uh, Brother uh, Foster talking about he and Brother Ray remodeled that place and there's some that have gifts of, of construction. I've always been more lenient to the gift of destruction but nonetheless there's some that they can construct well whether it's with wood or metal or what have you uh, but really there's always room for improvement. There's always some era that uh, could have done better. Uh, you know, there's some in our midst this morning that are very talented at different things, but there's always a way to do it better. To be truth, we're not masters of anything. Uh, but that's not the case with the Lord. When someone says master, that's rightfully, he earned that title. Because there is no improvement in him. We can't find any flaw or any error or any way he could have done it better because he is the master. And for a moment, I want us to look at the master here of perception. I'll be very quickly, if I can, I want to give you three main thoughts. And, of course, they have some, some uh, splinters off of those main thoughts. I want you to notice, first of all, he perceived her pain. Notice about her pain, she had a serious problem. The Bible tells us that she had this issue of blood for 12 years. She came into this world and uh, time and things had, had changed who she was and now she was a lady that was in great distress. Her problem was very serious. And the truth of the matter is uh, from what little bit of health knowledge I have, it is obvious to say and easy for even a novice to say that her problem left unchecked or unrepaired, if you will, would cause a fatality. It would cause her life. You just cannot have a problem like she had and uh, go on, especially in those days, without perishing. Her problem was very serious. I'm just going to hit this and move on. That problem cannot be more obvious to me than the problem that we have with sin. Right. Sin is such a serious problem. Yes. We look at our world today, and it is, has already been referred to in a great distress. Right. There's a messes from every angle, economical, yes. energy, uh, politically, uh, you know, globally. Our world is in a big mess. I mean, I'm going to tell you this morning what can fix it. You can have all of the summits and all of the phone calls and all of the treaties and, and there's places for things such as that, but the core problem cannot be fixed with legislation, cannot be fixed with uh, any type of treaty. The only way this problem can be fixed is a internal problem. It must be fixed uh, only through the blood of Jesus Christ and men turn their seeing the Christ and let them be born again. Yeah. Not only did she have a serious problem, but notice secondly, she sought many physicians. Yeah. The Bible tells us that this lady, she sought many physicians, but she grew the worse. Uh, for 12 years, in verse 12, the Bible said she spent all her living uh, I don't know what that would necessarily imply. Maybe that would imply she had a great deal of savings. Maybe that would imply that her husband had left her money and had deceased. Now maybe she was from a wealthy family and she had inherited a lot of money. But she had spent all of her living. Maybe that implied every dime that she made. She put it aside for her medical 
uh, expenses. You know, the sad part about that was, though she spent it, she never grew any better. She got worse. And she saw this position being referred to by a friend that there's a new practice in town and uh, he seems to know what he's doing. He's not like these old quacks we have around here, but, you know, he's been to Yale or Harvard or Duke or wherever they may have went to in that day, and he's got a lot more insight. She would scatter down there and make her appointment and sit in that waiting room, go in and be consulted, and leave dejected. He didn't give her any hope at all. And she was worse off by coming. Well, I can't help but think about this world today. They seek many physicians. Uh, some with their sin problem, they go down to Dr. Pleasure. And the Dr. Pleasure, his medicine is very sweet. Uh, Dr. Pleasure prescribes that what you really need with this irritating conscience is you need more relaxation. Uh, you need to go down to the beach more. And you need to run to the mountains more often. Or you need to take your Sundays and go out on the lake. You need to spend more time on yourself. Uh, because that's what's keeping you awake at night. You need more pleasure. Oh, Dr. Pleasure prescribes that. And people leave his practice and they go through his uh, advice and find they're just as bad. Then they run often to Dr. Intelligence. Now, we live in a world today that Dr. Intelligence, he's not seeing much new patients because he's just plumb uh, booked. I mean, hey, you know what the problem is? Fix it with education. That's how we fix this problem. It doesn't matter what problem it is. That's how the world says it needs to be fixed. Educate. They say in 2020 that the hands were the most washed things, but the truth of the matter is the brains were more washed than the hands. Uh, and that's what intelligence will do in our world today. They're not trying to teach you anything. They're trying to indoctrinate you in the world in which we live. But Mr. Intelligence, he swells your head, but he empties out your heart and soul. So they run to Dr. Intelligence and Dr. Pleasure. Then they run down to Dr. Religion. Now I'm telling you, Dr. Religion, he is really booked up. I mean, I passed a lot of his offices on the way to church this morning. I mean, Dr. Religion had them over yonder at the venue and at the cross bridge and at the jungle gym, whatever they call these no-name churches today. Uh, and they had them out there, and they're swaying, and they're swoven, and they're, they're up in the air. The lights are turned down low, and the smoke is rolling. And I'm telling you, the music's a blaring, and everybody walks out all pumped up. But I tell you, they're lost in their heart and soul often in time and Dr. Religion he may even prescribe a good Baptist church from time to time tell you you go down to that Baptist church but never mind about that preaching on sin just join the choir and, and just get baptized but don't do anything about your soul oh there's a lot of physicians people seek this woman sought many physicians. The only way a man can ever find the solution to his sin problem is not with intelligence, it's not with religion, it's not with good works, it's not with education. The Bible said, except a man repent, except he repent and trust Jesus Christ, put his faith and trust in the Lord and the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you, you can join the church and you can do your good works and, and all of that, but it will never take care of the root of the problem the Bible said ye must. It's not a suggestion. It's not an advice. But it is the only absolute way that your problem of sin can be dealt with, that your name can be written on the Lamb's book of life, that you will escape the awful place of hell, that heaven will be your eternal home. There is not but one way, and that way is through the door. And that door is the Lord Jesus Christ. That way is through the Redeemer of men's soul. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way a man can go to heaven and escape hell. So he perceived her pain. She had a serious problem and she sought many physicians. Then I want you to notice secondly, he perceived her pursuit. 
Notice a few things about her pursuit. Notice the hindrances she faced. Her hindrance, first of all, was obvious. Her hindrance was her sickness. Her sickness, the Bible says she had this issue of blood, and I'm sure that it was a challenge for her to commute many places, especially of any great distance. Her condition she was in did not assist her quest, her, her, her journey, and it was a difficult thing. She lived in a day and hour which there were very little amenities like we are blessed with today. So naturally, it was a downward pull for her to get to the Lord. It wasn't easy. It was a struggle. It was a challenge. And can I say, just going by nature, it would not have happened if she was waiting for a convenient time. Her life, there was no convenient time. I want to relate that for just a moment to our nature. Uh, our nature, you know, we get saved, but we don't get eradicated. Like Daddy said, the only way you'll ever live above sin is if you have an apartment over a bar room somewhere. We're not going to live in a world of sin and be above it. Our nature pulls us downward. God didn't save your nature. He did not save. You still have that old nature, and that nature will never pursue God. It'll never be convenient. Our nature will say, watch TV instead of read the Bible, or scroll social media instead of pray, or, uh, you know, go to sporting events instead of coming to a revival meeting, or go hunting. Amen. I guess we're a little too late for that, but go hunting instead of going on visitation. Our nature is a downward pull. You're going to have to get beyond that if we're going to seek the Master. Not only her sickness, but her skeptics. I'm sure in this crowd there were those that knew about this lady and her situation. You see, the law says someone in her physical condition should be separated from any type of ceremonial worship in public especially. I'm sure there were critics there and the apathetic there and the indifferent that were there. I, I don't know who was there. Nobody knows who all was there, but... Can't help but think maybe she got some mean looks or some pushes out of the way or some questions. There was a lot of people who said, you, you, don't, you don't belong here. Uh, you know, you, you ought to do something else. Or, uh, you know, this isn't your crowd. Skeptics, people that wanted to discourage her from getting to the Master. People that wanted to sidetrack her or delay her or to, uh, to just completely humiliate her in the situation she was in her trying to get to the Lord you know the only way she was going to get to the Jesus is she had to say can I just say what we say in Georgia fooey on all that mess you know, who, who, who cares uh, you don't have to want me to be here you don't, you don't have to like me to be here but there's something I need I, I need something from the Lord. And, and if you don't like it, that's fine. If I irritate you, I'll do my best to stay out of your way, but don't get in my way. I've got to get to Jesus. She had to push aside the skeptics, even internal skepticism. I, I don't know what she fought internally, but maybe she thought, fought the, the fact that he won't be where I can get to him. Or maybe uh, she fought the skepticism of, uh, I'm not going to be able to reach him. Or maybe she fought all types of discouragement. I'm saying, if she's going to get anything from the Lord, she's going to have to push aside the doubts and the skepticism. And we live in a world today that doubt and fear and all of that is propagated, not just in small settings, but on national television. Everything is fear. I mean, you got to have a hazmat suit to go out and check your mail it seems we live in a world today that is just propagated by fear but God my dear friend uh, perfect love cast out fear fear man brings a snail I'm not saying live like an idiot and go you know lick doorknobs or things like that I'm not saying be foolish but I'm saying that uh, we live in a world today that skepticism is so real in our world that can it really 
God get us out of this mess? Or uh, is revival really going to come? Or can God visit our His people again? Or will is God still in the big saving business? I'm saying all of that skepticism. She had to push it aside. Yeah. Hindrances. Not only hindering her pursuit, but notice the hearing that initiated her pursuit. In Mark chapter 5, it says, When she had heard of Jesus. And Mark is writing about this account. Can you imagine what it must have been like for her when she heard of the one that had opened the eyes of the blind was coming close. The one that had killed the sick. Uh, the one who had opened the ears of the deaf. Uh, who had cast out the devils. In that world, the probably the greatest of all things outside of Lazarus is he healed leprosy. Yep, right. All of these things, she may have thought, uh, uh, man, uh, maybe he can, I believe he can do something for me. Yeah. And then what, what really encouraged her is that he didn't require any money. Yeah, I mean, he was doing it free. Yeah. That was a good thing because she was plumb out yeah. of money. I mean, she didn't have two nickels to run, rub together, and now he wasn't looking for a doctor's reference. He wasn't looking for a copay. He, he wasn't looking for any type of money up front. Matter of fact, when it was all said and done, he didn't want any compensation at all. Right. Everything that he did was by grace and was for free. And that that just gave her a reason to go to him when she heard about him, when she heard what he had done, when she heard what he would not charge. She just wanted to get to him because she knew that if he had done it, that he still could do it. He didn't need to do a private observation. He didn't need to get her family tree. He didn't need to look over any medical records. He didn't need to see what type of prescription she was taking. Hey, my dear friend, all that she needed to do to get to him, and she knew that if she got to him, that would be sufficient for her need. I'm telling you this morning, the Bible said, where there is two or three gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. Can I say, if you need him this morning, I'm sure there's more than one that could stand up in this crowd and testify about how they, as you are, were in great need. Their family was a mess. Their marriage was in a mess. Their future was in a mess. But one day, they came to the Master, and the Master picked them up, and the Master put them back together, and the Master did what they needed and he can do that for you he can do that for you whatever it might be he perceived her pursuit he perceived her pain but thirdly notice he perceived her passion her faith if you will Matthew 9 and verse 21 she says for she said within herself if I may but touch his garment I shall be whole. Would you notice four things about her faith? Notice, first of all, the surety of her faith. I shall be whole. There's no doubt in her phraseology there. There's no, there's no skepticism or wishful thinking. There's surety. She knew, though he may have never done anything like this before, Though he may, she didn't know if he had or not, though he may never had healed by someone touching his garment, she knew that if she could touch it, she, should be whole. she would be whole. And I tell you this morning, you can be confident in the Lord's fixing and how he fixes it. I promise you, he won't put it back together half. He won't just kind of rig it up I mean, just kind of slap it together like some of us may do from time to time. You know, we don't want to fool with it. Uh, uh, but we, 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 we're compelled to, so we do the best we can. The Lord never does the best He can. 
The Lord don't do the best He can. I mean, every, he, the Bible says He does all things well. So He don't do the best He can. He does the best there is. You understand? When somebody does the best they can, it implies that it could have been done better. And I'm doing the best I can. I'm climbing up the rough side of the mountain. I'm winging my way back home, you know, and all this. I got news for you, dear friend. He's not doing the best he can. He's doing the best that is possible to be done. He wrote the book about the best. He is the book about the best. I mean, he's the persona of perfection. There is nothing to set beside him. Everything you put beside him comes way below uh, where he's at. I mean, he is the master. And she knew that he was the master. The surety of her faith. The size of her faith. Notice she did not say if I could touch his face or if I have him touch him, touch me or anything like that. She just knew if she could just touch the border, the hem, the, just the end of his garment. That he had enough in that touching of his garment for her need. You don't have to research what he's done. He's sufficient. Then notice, thirdly, the sublimity of her faith. The word sublimity just means wonderful or amazing. And I'm going to skim, skim through these. He, he, she witnessed the power of, God, of the Master. I mean, here she was. She was healed immediately. And then she witnessed the purpose of the Master. In Mark 5, 34, he called her daughter. Thy faith had made thee whole. I could be mistaken, but I do believe that is the only lady uh, in the Scriptures that, uh, that was uh, uh, such as this lady. He addressed as daughter. She wasn't just a whole, but, or heal, but she was whole. She wasn't just whole, but she was a part of the family. He called her daughter. She came there as an outcast. She came there as one that wasn't welcome. She came one that as one is defiled. But God did not just heal her sickness. He did not just make her whole, but he made her that once was an outcast, that once was defiled, that once was overlooked. He made her a part of the family. Some ask today, uh, you know, can he, can he help me? I'm telling you, he can. She got low and she touched him. But I want you to notice as I conclude this Last thought before we get into it. Notice the Lord says this. Who touched me? Now there's several questions in the Bible. I have a little series of messages. I preach on questions in the Bible. and The Lord's questions are what we would call often rhetorical questions. Like the first question God ever asked was to Adam, wasn't it? What did he say? Where art thou? As if the Lord didn't know where Adam was. But he did. You see, the Lord, when he asks questions often, he's not seeking information because he's a big theological word, omniscient. Simply means he knows everything. So he's not seeking information. It's not because he's ignorant regarding anything, and in this case, this woman. But it's rather he wants her not to tell where she's at. Not, he's not looking to know where she's at but he's asking her who touched me publicly where she can hear, hear so she won't reveal herself to him, but that he might reveal himself to her. You see, because this lady, as we read, she was leaving. She was, she was leaving the premises. And the Lord says, who touched me? He wants it to be stopped. He wants her to see him because he's already seen her. And I want you to notice in conclusion, and I'm going to labor on this for just a moment. I want you to notice the singularity of her faith. Here Jesus is in the crowd. The Bible uses this word. The Bible calls it uh, in verse 45. The multitude, that's a large gathering, throng thee and press thee. So Peter, the Lord says, who touched me? And Peter said, Lord, look at this crowd. And this is a, this is a 
enormous crowd. This is a multitude. And not only is it a multitude, they're, they're, all, they're all touching you. They're thronging you. They're pressing you. In other words, Peter's saying, Lord, it's, it's impossible for me to tell you who's all touched. It would be like, God forbid, you going to the game tonight in L.A., and you're sitting down beside your friend, and you said, now, who's in here watching the game with us tonight? They would look at you and say, are you kidding? I mean, I can't, t look at all these people in here. I don't know who all these people are watching the game with us. It's just too many to tell. That's how Peter is referencing the Lord respectfully. Lord, everybody's touching you. It's impossible for me to tell you who's touching you. The Bible said the master proceed. Yeah. There was one that touched him. Now, if you don't write anything down that I said, you write this. Many people thronged him, but only one touched him. You see, touching him to so many meant nothing. You see, they were all thronging, but only one was touching. Now I would say this this morning. You see, when, when, when this lady touched him, she was different. Everybody thronged him and nothing changed. You see here this morning, I don't, I'm not being condescending. But we have a quote unquote multitude here this morning thronging him wrong in him. We're all here. But the truth of the matter is when this lady walked away and this man walked away and they both said they touched him and his life isn't changed. But hers is completely different. They're going to say, wait just a minute. If she's completely different and she touched him, how come you're not completely different? And you said you touched him. You see, oftentimes we come into the house of God and we throng him. But all, oh, dear friend, the master perceives who's touching him. The master has all the perception. See, all you see here, me this morning is thronging him. All I see is you out there thronging him. And we just have faith and love for one another. We just believe we're both touching him. The truth of the matter is, I may be cold and indifferent, or you may be cold and indifferent, and we're not touching him. But I promise you this, the master knows. The master knows. And if you want to look at it from the positive side, the positive side, hey, everybody in here may be thronging him, but can I tell you, the master will crawl right up beside you, and he'll let you touch him. I mean, everybody may just be in it just because it's Sunday morning. Hey, it may be cold as, as Antarctica inside as well as outside. People may be thinking about what they're going to eat or where they're going to go eat or, or what they got to do Monday. I mean, the Lord may seem like He ain't even here. Sure, the singing's just as good and the preaching's just as loud and the activity is just as vibrant, but the Lord's not in the midst. Can I say, you don't have to get lost in that throng. I'm glad this morning that the dear loving Master of glory, He'll come right down in your situation and He'll let you touch Him. Everybody else can walk out and not touch Him at all. But He will be around those that want to touch Him. He perceives where you're at this morning. When you touch Him, everything changes. Your outlook changes. Hey, listen now. Your attitude changes. Listen, young people. Your dreams change. Mom and Daddy, your desires change. Your home change. Just like this lady in our text, everything about her life and future was completely changed when she touched him and he touched her. So, you look at this woman 
And you see that among the multitude, she was the last one you ever would have thought would have touched the Lord. But the Lord not only let her touch him, but he touched her. I'm telling you this morning, that's what I need. That's what you need. You know what we need in our home? We need a touch from him. And we need to get low and touch him. I just love the fact that he perceives it. He knows where you're at. He knows if you need a touch. He knows what's going on in your world. When nobody else, they're so caught up in the thronging. I'm telling you, you get low. You can get in the touching. And he'll touch you. Because he knows. He's the master of perception. Well, will you bow your heads with me this morning? Our musician will come and find us just anything on the piano of invitation. I don't know where you're at spiritually. I don't know where you're at in areas of your life. But maybe you may be here this morning. You're lost without Christ. You're not, you're not saved. You come into this place this morning under the weight of sin. And I tell you, the Master can heal all your sin problems. You'll just come. He knows where you're at. You may be hiding it from everybody here, but He knows. Why don't you come? Father, we pray in Jesus' name you'll have your will and way. And we ask it. Lord, realizing that without Thee, we can do nothing. And we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.